Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the European Employment and Social Rights Forum that is taking place here on the 16th and the 17th of November in Brussels here in the GAG and also online. Now, this is the second forum already organized by the European Commission's Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion and focuses on AI and the world of work. My name is Sasha Vakulina, I'm Euronews presenter and it's our great honor to be your hosts for today. A very warm welcome indeed, ladies and gentlemen. I am also honored to be your host. My name is Ali El Jabri. I'm a professional moderator and presenter, a former TV correspondent for Associated Press News and lecturer of public policy. It's a great pleasure to be with you. The event of today is taking place to the background of the European Year of Skills, which aims to help Europeans acquire the skills they need for quality jobs and help European enterprises get the skilled talent they need to realize their ambitions and make the economy grow. How about an applause for our forum? <laughs> a list of practical remarks. It's quite a long one. Please bear with me. The Wi-Fi code is on the screen behind us. A QR code is on your badge that will take you to the program and social media links. Please do join us on the live feed of X, former Twitter, and make use of the live photo feed on Flickr. Interpretation to and from English, French, and German will be available, as well as international sign language, and a velotypist will provide subtitles. Please do return the headsets upon leaving the room. This event is hybrid, so an audience from all over the world can join us, watch, and interact. During the panel sessions, you may use Slido, and the QR code is right there for that, to send in your questions and comments. Sasha. It is great to see you all here. Thank you for being here. And if you are joining us online, you're invited to use the networking feature to meet and connect with other participants by chat or by a video call. Now, share your experiences at the forum in social media. You can use the hashtag EU social forum. You can also see it on the screen. If you lost any item or personal belonging, please refer to the reception desk. And if you wish to book meeting room during the event, please refer to the reception desk as well, they're going to help you out there. It's time for our first speaker to officially kick off the event. He's Director General at DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. Please join us welcoming Mr. Joost Korte. Thank you very much, Ali and Sasha, for your introductory words. And of course, welcome to all for the second European Employment and Social Rights Forum. I'm very happy to see so many of you here in the room and surely also many people watching from home or from the office. Um, this year's edition, as you know, focuses on the impact of artificial intelligence on the world of work. And it goes without saying that this issue is extremely topical. One year ago, Chat um, GPT burst onto the scene, which has since fueled a public debate about artificial intelligence, a debate that is actually still ongoing. And just two weeks ago, we witnessed the first global AI safety summit at Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom, and also a G7 agreement on the guiding principles on artificial intelligence. And as we speak, the negotiations are in the final stages on the proposed Artificial Intelligence Act, which should become the first legal framework worldwide regulating the use of AI in the European Union. This is a good start, and it shows that the European Union is at the forefront and the first mover on the global scene. And it is necessary for policymakers to take artificial intelligence very, very seriously. That's why I'm so happy that you're all here today and tomorrow. Why? Because we are really at the cusp, on the cusp of a major transformation of our economies, as technology like artificial intelligence is radically changing the rules of the game. It is reshaping our labor markets, as well as the employer working relationship. Artificial intelligence means changes, many changes, but not necessarily only bad changes. We hear, of course, many scary stories that artificial intelligence will destroy jobs, with some reports estimating even 
that approximately 300 million jobs worldwide could be at risk of automation. And we even hear worse stories, Terminator-like doomsday scenarios, according to which artificial intelligence could even spell the end of humanity. But we've heard this before. Research, serious research on artificial intelligence tells us that it could also bring near 6.5 trillion euro increase in annual global GDP over the next 10 years. AI can also boost companies' productivity and competitiveness. Instead of replacing jobs entirely, artificial intelligence can assist workers in performing tasks more effectively. And as you will have seen today, because the autumn forecast of the European Commission came out, we are confronted now for a, m a number of years with labor shortages, Unpre uh, unprecedented low unemployment and labor shortages. Surely, it is debatable that artificial intelligence can help us to overcome these shortages and also um, the aging of our societies. But of course, the adoption of technologies like artificial intelligence cannot come at the expense of workers' rights. If left unchecked, the use of artificial intelligence in the workplace could lead to more inequality in those labor markets. Automated surveillance and monitoring can also put workers under pressure, invading workers' privacy. Another scare story, the use of AI in, by Amazon in the United States to measure the productivity of their workers, which is surely something we cannot accept in the European Union. It can lead to discrimination in hiring and firing. Roughly one quarter of European companies are planning to use AI tools to support their recruitment processes. Another major issue is also the use, is the, use of cop the protection of copyrights and royalties that are uh, impacted by the use of AI. We therefore need really to think about the right regulatory framework to prevent abusive practices and ensure that the human remains in control. That is why as previously mentioned by Commission President von der Leyen, we are keeping a very close eye on the need to regulate the use of algorithms in the workplace. And for this to understand better, we really need you. We, that is why we organized the forum today and tomorrow. We want to listen to understand better what the impact is and how we can best regulate. Luckily, we don't start from scratch. Uh, the Commission proposal for a directive on improving working conditions in platform work which is currently also being negotiated by the European Parliament and the Council, is already a first important step. It puts forward a new set of, right, set of rights and rules on the use of automated systems in platform work. And this means that automated decisions must be checked by humans. However, the impact of, of AI, of course, extends well beyond platform work only. It will impact the entire employer-worker relationship and it poses important questions in terms of labor law, social dialogue, and other issues. Employers also need workers with skills, of course, that can complement the technology. The OECD estimates that two out of five companies lack the relevant skills, um, that in two out of five companies, their workers lack the relevant skills, and it is a true barrier to the introduction and the use of AI. That's why the European Year of Skills, which we are still in the middle of, provides also an important platform to raise these issues, uh, uh, the importance of those issues. So, big challenges lie ahead, and we need to find the right balance, encourage innovation, while at the same time protect workers' rights and the most vulnerable people in our society. And for this, the European pillar of social rights remains our compass. And this is exactly the kind of discussion that I'd like to have with you today and tomorrow to learn and to advance. We will, I will not go into the program because I think the moderators will take you through, but I can tell you that the program is, um, is a very good one. Today we have, I think, 17 high-level speakers, and in total, when I also look at tomorrow, there are no less than 70 speakers, 70 speakers. Today, of course, more on AI. Tomorrow, the DG Employment, Social Policies and Inclusion also puts in, in display other activities that we're doing that are also very important to build social Europe and to implement the pillar of social rights. I'm looking forward to a very interesting two days and I thank you for your intention.
thank you so much for opening that. Indeed, we do have two days packed with the sessions and panels and stay with us here in Brussels and also online. And to start that, we're going to also invite you to participate via the tool called Slido. Now, you can have now all the instructions. You could see it also on the screen. Let's do the first poll just to open and to check the room temperature here and online as well. Now, the first question for the first poll is how do you assess the impact of AI on the world of work? You've got five options there. You just need to open Slido on any tool that you're using, any device that you are using, you've, or you can also have the QR code there. And you've got to use the hashtag EESRF23. You can also see it on the screen and check your badge and the back of it as well. Now, the options are it is a great opportunity. It is an opportunity. It brings challenges and opportunities, and it brings many challenges. Now, four options that are visible here on the screen. Please do vote and connect with whatever device you're using. It is really important for us to get you guys on board and to get everybody to participate in the conversations and to set this tone for the discussions. And while you're voting, uh, let's take a quick look at the opinion poll. Now, this is what you have seen and participated in when entering the venue. And the question there was, what do you think is the main impact of AI on the world of work? We hope you participated in the entrance. If not, you still have that possibility. And here they are. You could see some of the answers. Challenge and opportunities, facilitator, more efficiency. Well, that's a big answer here. Innovation, agility, versatility, and efficiency. That's four issues there, but I do understand that it could be really hard to choose just one. And we have to do more to work now in less time. Better jobs, matched skills, new life tools. These are just some of the options that you've mentioned there. Please keep going. All right. And uh, please keep voting for the slider poll. And let's take the first to look at the answers that you've given on those four options that are visible there. How do you assess the impact of AI on the world of work? Well, here you have it. Great opportunity. An opportunity it brings challenges and opportunities, and it brings many challenges. 77% bring challenges and opportunities. Look at the difference. This is a really a landslide. With 12%, well, I've just seen it there. With It's an opportunity. Now, most of you think that it is a great opportunity, 77%. Keep the thought, keep voting. It's going to be really interesting also to look how your opinion and how your heart changes or not by the end of today and also during the day tomorrow. There we go, 78%. Keep voting, keep voting. You'll see the situation will be changing and we really want to hear from you. And now I want to invite here on stage a keynote speaker, Professor Christopher Pisaridis, Regis Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics, co-founder and co-chair of the Institute for the Future of Work and winner of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on labor market frictions and technology. Please, the stage is yours. OK, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I need to have some slides in front of me to talk, and I only see a slide or so far. So can you please load the slides? Uh, let me give you a, a brief introduction. I was asked to talk about um, AI in particular, but also more generally about technological innovations and, um, and what's happening to labor markets. And in fact, I was specifically asked to go back to history, to industrial history, and um, compare what we are experiencing now with um, what we experienced in the past. In fact, one email I got said, uh, could go back to the beginning of human history. Well, I didn't go back that far, but I briefly went back to the beginning of industrialization. So let me give you some kind of historical introduction and um, what's been going on before, because um, I think we have very short memories. When I hear what people say about AI and about this time, what's happening, it, it, it really is short memory. It reminds me so much of, uh, of football commentators. If they watch a good game, and especially if their team wins, they say, oh, this is the best game we've seen in this league for years and years, and then next week, there's another good game, and say, oh, this is by far the best game we've seen. <laughs> and, that's, and, uh, and, and sometimes I get the impression that um, people commenting about um, 
technology and jobs have as much uh, memory as the football commentators on, on TV. So, so let's take a more kind of reason boring approach, if you like, and talk about that. Now, we know that in the uh, pattern of economic development is that there is some, some big technological development that leads to a major economic transformation. And after that, life is different. There is a new normal. And that's what we call an industrial re revolution. Now, industrial revolutions don't happen very frequently, but when they happen, the, the, the economy has to transform, especially the, especially the labor market. And um, the question is, how big is the transformation? Is it a good one? Is it, uh, are we going to be successful? You know, those are the questions now, as we all know, because we heard it so many times, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And um, if we look back, you know, there have been other three industrial re revolutions. It is quite interesting when you start thinking about what caused those industrial revolutions, and usually it's some source of power, that um, there is machinery that can do things, that, there's machinery that is more powerful and can do things faster. So the first one, it was steam power. Before the first industrial revolution, we used to do things by muscle power in cottage industries. Um, sorry, in, in, in home, cottages, the cottage industry, as it was known. Then steam came along, that there, there were improvements, you know, James Watt and so on, and, and others with the steam engine, where steam could move heavier things and it could do th things uh, uh, faster. I don't know how, where I have to point this to change, but uh, there you go. Um, now, steam, which was the first one, it brought more structural change to the economy than AI will ever will, ever will. Because whereas before people lived in the countryside and worked on the farm and, and in their cottages, when steam came along, they had to work in a factory because there was heavy machinery, it was expensive machinery. How do you build factories and uh, get people to work there? By urbanizing them. And that's what brought uh, uh, urbanization. So you can imagine that something that moves production from the countryside and the home to urban cities in factories, that we had to build urban cities, we have to provide the logistics, the infrastructure. Of course AI will not do these things. I mean, AI is not going to change the way Brussels looks or London or Paris or something. It's just going to change the, the things they do. So don't kind of exaggerate by what you see, and in fact, with the steam, we had the industrial state was first born. It was first in Britain, then the United States, mainly with British uh, investments in technology, then continental Europe, around Germany, France. Now, the Luddite incidents that I'm sure you heard uh, very frequently about, it, it was not about machines taking over their jobs. That's a, a, a kind of misinterpretation of what they were doing. The Luddites were skilled crafts men, people, who were working in the cottage and paid well. And after that, with the arrival of a factory, factory workers were getting paid more. And that's what they objected. They objected because they lost that leadership they had in the labor market. And, and that's what happens. Unless you adapt to the new technology, your pay is not going to go up. And, and drawing the parallel now, unless we learn how to use AI and we apply it in our jobs, we are not going to be paid as much, but the jobs will still be there. Um, and um, something very similar happened in the 1920s when oil came along as a source of uh, energy and, and coal was known at this time as King Coal. The coal, the coal miners were the, uh, at the top of the pay scales. They started losing that position and they went into general strikes and objected. The workers object when they lose their the, the top, but they, they can never reverse it. You know, it happened in Britain again in the 1980s with uh, coal miners. The, 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 the secret of success when new technology comes is that you have to learn the new technology, adopt it. Don't try and fight it because you're going to lose. Um, now, electricity was the second industrial revolution. I, I, I believe electricity was bigger than steam and it was the biggest uh, industrial revolution of all. And um, sometimes people look at me in astonishment when I uh, tell them that. And then I said to them, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you a choice. For one week, 
you live without electricity, or for one week, you live without anything digital. You give up your phones, you give up your laptops, everything else. Which one would you choose? I don't think anyone over the age of 15 chooses to lose their phones and their laptops. <laughs> the, sorry, chooses to lose electricity to keep their phones and laptops if they're fully charged. Everyone will say, of course, you know, with, without electricity, I cannot live. Whereas without my laptop, it might even be a blessing. And therefore, electricity is more important an invention than, uh, than, than digital technologies. Um, electricity, again, was an even more powerful uh, source of energy. It was cleaner, it was easier to use, and of course, it brought the assembly line to the factory, and that's when Henry Ford made his uh, reputation. He invented the assembly line, uh, basically. I've recently been reading, actually, about Henry Ford. He wasn't very much in favor of, of good work, so the introduction you gave about good work, I, I don't think um, old Henry Ford would have approved of that. But let's not criticize people who've done so much for productivity. Um, now, why, why was um, electricity so important? Well, that's because of, uh, of, of both machinery, but also consumer durables, and of course, lighting up the cities, all, all our cities, the heat, heating, uh, light, and, um, and, and of course, you know, especially if you view it together with the internal combustion engine that was being run on, 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 on gasoline and, and the invention of the motor car, which is what Henry Ford was doing, of course. Um, and um, you, it made the structural transformation so much that about 40% of the labor force was employed in factories producing consumer durables, basically, and basic, mainly, and other machinery. Um, and the social transformations that that does was is quite astonishing. You know, it it it, it liberated women mainly. It was it was a fantastic development for women because it freed their time from working at home. Then you could employ the machinery and get a job outside. And in fact, that's where we observed the first rise in um, labor force uh, participation of, of women. Now, at the same time, especially in America, where most of the research was done, a, a lot of the um, immigrants into America, especially Irish women, Italian women, used to go and work in the homes of rich Americans, providing domestic service. All those jobs were lost, so they had to get outside and get other jobs because they had washing machines, um, vacuum cleaners, refrigerator, actually, the most important of all. So you didn't have to go and shop every day. Uh, so whereas before, middle class families had the, their shop, their shopper, the one who makes the clothes, the one who cleans, the one who cooks, and all that, and now you replace that with machinery. It, it, it brought a big social change. It was social liberation. And uh, <clears throat> for the, it was for that reason that um, Robert Gordon is some quite well-known work on uh, rates of economic growth. He claimed that uh, we'll never again see such a big growth in productivity, manufacturing, and such a big rise in the standard of living as we saw up to about the 1970s when, <coughs> uh, when every home had the consumer durables that we're used to uh, today. <coughs> now, next. Who is, who is in charge of turning it? Nothing is it's moving now. No? Why isn't the... No, no? Ah. Oh, no, it moved too much now. <laughs> okay. Sorry, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, at that time, another feature of... Um, of what happened then was that people as distinguished as John Maynard Keynes, my favorite economist as, as a student, actually, I, the, the, the book, you know, you, you might think that I'm strange, but the, the most exciting book I ever read as a student was The General Theory of Keynes. It's fantastically well written. It has constant references to uh, literature and all that. It's, it's really like reading a storybook, but of course it's heavy economic theory. Well, just before he wrote The General Theory, that uh, caused the biggest revolution in economics, of course, that's ever happened. He, he said that uh, 100 years from the time he was writing, uh, 2030, 
um, there would be no work to do because technology was going to take over all the jobs. Because he could see it at the time that the new technological improvements were replacing labor and manufacturing. Now, was he right? Well, he was right if the whole economy was made up of manufacturing. You know, manufacturing was employing 40% at the time, it's now employing about 10%. So what happened to the other 30% of the labor, of, of the labor force? Well, they went and got jobs in services. What he couldn't imagine at the time was that the service sector was going to grow to the extent that it did, and there would be as much demand for services as it is now. Hospitality was practically unknown. There were two or three hotels in central London, his experience, and that was it. There was no travel for tourism. Now those are two massive industries. Health and care was taking place at home. Now it takes place outside. We're employing about 12 to 15 percent of the labor force in the health and care sector. And, and that's what we should always bear in mind, that we, we don't have to know now where the jobs are going to come from 20 years from now. In fact, if we, if we try and predict, we're, not going, we're going to get it wrong. What, what we should know, though, now is that there will be enough demand from uh, wealthy societies and they're wealthy because of the technological improvements, that jobs will be created if we want to do them. Now, of course, if we get wealthier through productivity improvements and new technology, then 20 years from now, we're not going to want to work as many hours as we do. Only a few years ago, we were working 40 hours a week, uh, 50 weeks a year. Now we work 36, 37 hours a week for 45 weeks of the year. You know, we, we work less. And if you look over, um, I'm not sure if I have actually a slide later on, but if, if you look at which European countries work more or less, it, it might surprise you if you haven't looked at the figures, but the, 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 the countries that work the smaller number of hours over the year are Germany and the Netherlands. They're also the more, most productive. The country that uh, works the longest hours during the week, during the year, I'm proud to say that is Greece. Greek, the Greeks are the har hardest working Europeans. You don't know that, did you? <laughs> and, and, and of course, it's related to their productivity. You know, the, the poor Greek has to work all the time to make half the money that the German makes. That's misfortune, what can you do? Um, so as we're taking more time off, more, demand for, for, for services will be created. But, but, but Keynes, despite his many, many um, uh, insights in, in economics, he'd forgotten that, um, that there is a service sector that is going to go on growing and growing. Leontief actually made the same mistake in 1983. That, that's, that's more surprising because by 1983, manufacturing was already declining and uh, our economies were service economies especially the United States economy where he was living. Now, we come now to the 1970s and the third industrial revolution, that's the computers. Um, that's um, cities and our homes were electrified by this time. And um, productivity growth was falling. Of course, the level was still uh, high. And the uh, computers are introduced. Again, there was talk that we're going to lose our jobs. In fact, lots of jobs were lost to computers, the sort of middle range administrative jobs. But, um, and, 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 and we know a lot more about um, what um, happened to labor with uh, computers because they've been studied extensively. The pioneers in that was David Otter and his colleagues at MIT. Then lots more work was done in Europe as well. Now, the things that, the things that computers do, they were things done by people who were earning not the lowest um, uh, wages and the salaries in the market, not the highest, but the middle ones, sort of middle skill, They're mainly administrative uh, jobs, you know, sort of desk desk job, desk work. And those were the jobs that were affected most. And because they're in the middle, the term polarization was introduced, that that's what computers caused, or the hollowing out of the middle. But what happened? OK, we lost jobs in the middle. You know, look at universities. We had a typing pool. That, that has gone completely. We had administrators doing filing. Those have gone completely as well. But the lower down the scale, the um, 
various people doing the manual, semi-manual work of building maintenance and all that are still there. And of course, the, uh, the, the administrative, the, the academic stuff are still uh, there. Um, what happened? Well, new jobs were created and those people were taken in. Computers did, didn't cause unemployment. They didn't cause the loss of, of work. Would we have known where those uh, uh, people have gone? The answer is no, you couldn't guess in 1980 where all those people would have gone. In fact, we thought in 1980, we thought we were going to see productivity improvements. We didn't see them. And therefore, you got Bob Solow's famous quip that, uh, that we see computers everywhere except for the productivity statistics. Well, one main reason, of course, is that um, we, we saw a big impact on the quality of, the, of, of work. You know, web processing produced much better documents than typewriters much better filing and storage of information than we had before, but that is not measured in the way we measure productivity. We, we've lost that. But this is what happened, though, to, uh, you know, the, the, this, these are European data done by my colleagues at the LSE, Alan Manning, uh, Anna Salomons, and uh, Martin Gould, I think. And um, the um, light blue lines are the middle earning jobs, that's the loss of jobs in all those, and then the dark blue are uh, the workers who lost their jobs that moved to higher paying jobs. Those were the more qualified workers doing the middle earning ones. And the um, ones that um, were not qualified to move up, they moved to the left to the less paying jobs with red lines. And you, and you can see actually, I mean, it, I, I mean, it is intuitive, you know, if you see Sweden, for example, most of them moved to the right because, as we know, the educational standards there are higher than they are in, um, you know, if you take Greece and Italy, for example, there was a lot of movement to the left to lower paying jobs when computers arrived than the right when you compare with Sweden and uh, Ireland, which is on the, here. And, and, and it's a typical scenario, you know, when you shock jobs in a certain range of the labor market, then those workers get jobs somewhere else. That's why when you hear people like Elon Musk saying it's definitely the end of work, just don't believe him. I mean, the only, the, the only, the only saving grace for, for Musk is that there's something very similar was said about Keynes, and you know, if Keynes can make the mistake, we forgive Elon Musk, he can make it too. <laughs> but it's still a mistake. Um, so there you go, the fourth industrial revolution. Now let's talk about AI. It's characterized by automation, robotics, and AI. Robots are employed almost exclusively in manufacturing. They do manual tasks. Those are the boring jobs. Uh, what they produce are tradable goods. They increase productivity. They take work from humans, and that's a good thing because there's no way we can make those jobs that robots do with apologies to our robot here, actually. <laughs> There's no way we can, we can make those good jobs. I'm afraid, don't look at me. <laughs> don't tell me that, 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 that it was on its own that did that, <laughs> it. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's good, you know, the job that is left is good for humans. Now, of course, manufacturing employment has gone down, but you, you, you'd be surprised though because the, the countries that um, are most robotized, there you, there you go. H here, n not me, <laughs> you shouldn't be looking. You should be looking at my, at my fantastically interesting graph. What happened to it? Oh, there it is. The, um, the, the, here, what, what you see here is how robotized manufacturing is in these countries. And, the, and, and the, there are some certain distinguishing features. The most robotized countries are South Korea, Singapore, that produces chips with robots. Uh, Japan, Germany, uh, Sweden, Hong Kong, also chips. Th those countries are also the biggest exporters and they, are the most successful, and they have the most successful manufacturing. The, the countries right at the end, who haven't taken on uh, as many robots, are the ones that have less successful manufacturing. It's basically the rest of Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. And of course, the great absentee from all this is the United Kingdom. It's not there at all. UK manufacturing is not even, the, there are 21 countries here. It's not even in the top um, 21. So maybe, maybe the, the, the Brits have uh, skipped robots and moved on to AI 
sort of a leap onto, on, 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 onto, onto AI, and that's why they had the conference that was just mentioned uh, now. It, it must be a British person in control of this diagram. <laughs> yeah, he keeps moving it away. <laughs> I shall take my revenge. <laughs> OK, there's another one that doesn't, that, that doesn't show Britain in very good light, I'm afraid. The, uh, the, 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 the pink bars shows the number of robots that were installed in, ma in the manufacturing of these countries. And I took four countries because they are representative of what I want to say. That's Britain, France, Japan, and Germany. Japan and Germany are way ahead, France and Britain, in the installation of, of robots in manufacturing. The blue bars show the change in employment in the manufacturing of these countries. And you can see that, that Britain, with the, with the smallest uh, robot incidents, lost most jobs in manufacturing. Next comes France, next Japan, and next Germany. And of course, the reason is that robots improve productivity, and, you, and they exported more, whereas France and Britain didn't manage to keep competitive enough in the export markets, and they lost. Now, you might say, well, how does the whole world cannot export more because we're exporting to each other? Well, of course not, but, but we're Europe. When you look at European manufacturing, the way it advances, it could export, the whole of Europe could export more because European manufacturing is it, it's not as big as the whole world manufacturing. You know, let other countries lose jobs in manufacturing, unfortunately. I mean, this is what market competition is. Whereas here we can see Germany succeed in Japan, succeeding South Korea, who have been amongst them on the right. Whereas on the left, you see what's happening. Okay, so what's the future of robotics? Well, I'm afraid, well, not I'm afraid, it belongs to China. Because China is currently ins installing more robots than the rest of the world put together. It's still employing about 30 or 40 percent of its labor force, so it's where uh, European and American manufacturing were in the 1960s. Um, but it's taking on more and more robots, it's improving productivity, it's moving on to higher technology, it's, it's using a lot of AI. Uh, employment will fall in its manufacturing because it's big enough and once you robotize so much, employment will fall. But there will be a lot more competition with high tech goods and we're already seeing it in fact with electric cars, for example, that, that you all know about. Um, now, of course, for their manufacturing to flourish, they need to buy more manufacturing goods at home as well. It, 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 they still haven't domesticated the, the demand. They still rely entirely on exports, but, but it's going to come. So we sit back, we enjoy the small niche manufacturing that we have, and um, we <laughs> buy Japanese, uh, Chinese cars. What can you do? Um, <laughs> We focus on AI. Now, AI. Now, with AI, the problem is that it's still a big unknown. We don't know uh, how much is being used, and that's why we can make claims like the ones that uh, Elon Musk made recently, because we don't really know. We can just agree or disagree. Um, there's a lot of hype about it, of course, and um, when you look at surveys of employers about using AI, about 80% of them say that, yes, they are using AI, but it, it's not AI, serious AI, though. I mean, it might be using Zoom software to uh, have some workers working from home. What, what employers mean, I think, when they say AI is that they use digital technologies to communicate. If, even in, um, in finance, when you have the um, FinTech and all that, there's always a talk about, I think, at least, four, I saw a report written about four years ago, and only about 5% of financial transactions were controlled by AI. It, 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 it's all done in the way it used to be done. But the potential is there. And the mistake that so many people made, including economists, I'm afraid, is that they look at the potential and they say, oh, it's going to happen. But potentials don't always happen because we have a choice. It, it, it's, it, you know, if, it, if we have machinery that has certain capabilities, it doesn't mean that we're going to use those cap capabilities. You know, I mean, like, we have machinery that could destroy the world. We don't use it, though, because we have sense, I hope, fingers crossed. You know? and, and the same goes with, with, with this. Now, 
what, um, what, what we can say about AI is how good are we with our infrastructure and we are capabilities, you know, like I have a list in the first bullet points of everything. It's digital infrastructure, innovation, capabilities, well-trained human capital, openness to interaction with other similar countries, and quality of labor force institutions, and good social support. Countries that score highly on that are the countries that can use AI beneficially to their benefit and to creating good jobs and better lives. And when you look at that, uh, and um, I mean, it's not I who looked at them, so institutes that did the research. Uh, the United States and China are way ahead in terms of preparedness for uh, AI. We're already seeing it. But of course, they dismally fail on social support. So I wouldn't say that they are creating good jobs and happy, happy workers. But they are creating uh, workers who work with AI. Then just below US and China, we have Germany, Japan, South Korea, the same countries that were robotized uh, before, and some other of the Northern European countries. Next tier, we have uh, the rest of Europe. So that's tier number three. And tier number four, we have South, uh, South America, Africa, and the rest of uh, Asia. That's, that's good news. But then why is in the whole of Europe up to US and China is, and hopefully given the initiatives that the European Commission is taking in individual countries, we will be moving up rather than um, raising the gap between uh, US and China and, and, and Europe. Now, there have been some informed guesses about um, jobs. What we know is that the AI could affect a lot more jobs than uh, robots and um, computers. We know computers are in the middle of the skills distribution. We know robots are mainly in manufacturing and uh, other sort of heavy jobs. Don't look at me again. <laughs> um, what we know about AI is that it could affect all jobs except for the very, very top managerial ones. Uh, and that's especially uh, since the uh, generative AI was invented with chat GPT, then you could replace. Um, the, the, the jobs I see most at risk are paralegals, uh, civil servants. Paralegals are people, young people who finish their uh, legal training and they go and work with big uh, legal uh, companies, firms as they call them in English at least, that uh, they compile reports for their senior lawyers. They look into archives, similar cases. When they are successful, they move on to um, um, become senior lawyers. Those jobs look like uh, they, they'll be gone. So the legal profession will have to work out how to recruit senior lawyers if you lost the stepping stone. You know, so you go step. You finish your graduate study, you become a paralegal, you become a lawyer. If you lose that middle one, how do you make this leap? Um, the um, in civil service, lots and lots of uh, people employed in the civil service are collecting information for the heads of departments, for the minister. The minister might want to know about something going on in a foreign country because they're going to visit. They might want to know what's happening in their own country with uh, various institutions. You have... Um, uh, young civil servants uh, writing those reports. You could get ChatGPT to do it much faster. And, um, and we have to think how to deal with that. Of course, they're still making mistakes. I was rather uh, amused to hear that the, the, the Oxford Dictionary, I, I think it is the Oxford, it might be the Cambridge, because I always get those two places confused with each other. <laughs> to me, there is uh, London here and uh, Oxbridge on the other side. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I'm glad to see, I was, I was amused to see that the Oxford Dictionary, each year it chooses one which is the word of the year, and the word of the year this year was hallucinate, <laughs> which of course is the name that we give to the mistakes that uh, ChatGPT makes. It was quite interesting, they, fo they chose to focus the mistakes that ChatGPT makes, not the things that it gets right. Anyway. <laughs> um, is there going to be a job shortage? The answer is no. Uh, I don't think so, because if we want to invent the jobs, we're going to invent them. What we should be asking at, what, should, what we should be asking is um, uh, what skills are we going to need to flourish with AI? 
and um, not whether there will be jobs. I guarantee you there will be jobs, but you need to have the right skills if you are going to do well. And um, the skills, I've, I've just realized there is a minus 13 there, which means I exceeded my time. By the, do, do you see it? Oh, you don't see it, so I'm okay. I'm not going to reveal any more about that. Uh, so the answer is that we, we don't know where the jobs are, are going to come from. Um, the only, the only thing economists are good at predicting, actually, is that uh, bad politics brings uh, economic uh, regress. Um, you know, look at uh, Syria, for example, look at North Korea. That, that's the only thing they're good at, and, and it took so long for people to write a book about it. You know, it was the uh, Asimov Robinson Johnson book, of course, that emphasized it even more. You know, why do countries fail? Um, so don't speculate about what, where jobs are going to come from. Don't say that there will be no jobs. There will be jobs, and you need to have the skills to succeed. The top skills, IT, data processing, operations, and logistics, and engineers are the, uh, are the more technical ones that are going to drive the progress forward. They're absolutely necessary because data is the new currency. We, we, that's how we learn. That's how a company progresses. But there will be a minority of jobs. The majority of jobs would be the ones that require the skills below. I know that because we've just done a survey of all jobs being advertised in Britain for the last six years, and that's what people want. That's what employers want. They, they want people that have good communication skills, supervisors, peer support seniors, because good jobs require good communication within the company. Reliability, self-discipline, creativity, critical thinking, leadership, managing people, advanced communication and negotiation skills. Th those skills apply to all jobs in the economy, more than 80%. The skills above are the more um, exciting ones, but maybe they apply to 20%. So any of you, any students who come to ask me what uh, should I learn, I said, well, learn some good mathematics so that you have a chance to succeed in the top range. Learn some good language, good communication skills, because you are going to need it, whatever you do. And that's the best advice you can give to anyone if you have uh, children who are wondering what to specialize in. Okay, am I still, go am I still going on or shall I just? All right. <laughs> No, sit down, sit down. Um, now, non-technical service sectors. So those, those are the ones I just um, mentioned. You know, the, the, the jobs of the second category will be in the health sector, in hospitality. They will be creating most jobs. The challenge is how do we make these jobs attractive for a large number of workers? Because if you say to them, there will be jobs in the health and care sector, there will be jobs in hospitality, they might say, but these are not good jobs and all that. Well, that's precisely where we have to work on. We have to work in making them good jobs, and it's good that, th th that this kind of conference is focusing on good jobs because we could make them very good. Uh, we could make them very good jobs and make them very attractive for young people to, to go into. And, um, Whereas if you look now at the, uh, how workers feel about their jobs, they are very unhappy about their jobs. The only, when you look at life satisfaction surveys, the, the only activity that uh, people say gives them less happiness or more unhappiness than going to work is being sick. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, like you spend so much of your time at work and they say the worst of all is, is, is being sick. And, and then also one-off events, obviously, you know, like death and divorce and all that. Although sometimes when I see some of my divorced friends, they're anything but unhappy. But, <laughs> but, but, but in surveys, they say they are, I don't know. Um, but on a regular basis, it's... Then the next unhappy thing is work. And then when they say to them, what are you most unhappy about going to work? Number one is commuting. People hate commuting. I don't blame them, actually. I, mean, I hate the crowded trains and all that. And the second one is seeing your boss. Well, the boss, you, you, should be, you should know how to communicate your boss and work together for the benefit of the company, not to say, you know, like the thing that gives people most anxiety is when a message comes, comes up, uh, uh, across and says, your boss wants to see you at such and such a time. You know, you start shaking. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's not a good job, whereas if you improve conditions at work, 
then those should be good events. They say, ah, what a good chance, I'm going to see my boss and I'm going to talk about the future of this company and what my role is going to be. So anyway, these are the features that, that workers like about work. They like better communication with managers and subordinates, more transparency about company policy, better social relations with colleagues, more time flexibility, including homework in their four-day week. Uh, more time flexibility, I'm all in favor of that as well, actually. It's better work-life uh, balance. Um, oops, we've lost the second half of this survey. I wonder what happened. This is a survey that the American Psychological um, actually, it doesn't say anything more than here. It just gives percentages to uh, how many people say they like certain things. It's done by an American Psychological Association, just to give you the evidence. Now, I have some two or three issues that were raised during uh, conversations we had before. Hours of work, workers like flexibility, work from home, you avoid commuting. Uh, product, as productivity is rising, hours are falling. We take hours off, no problem with that. Oh, here's the correlation I promised you. You don't see it very well, but it's the examples I used before. Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, low hours, high productivity, Greece, Mexico on the left, low productivity, high hours. This is from OECD. Um, and then I was asked to say briefly what happened to globalization and geopolitics. The thing that worries me most about, in fact, is the deteriorating geopolitics because, as I mentioned before, the only accurate prediction economists have ever made is that bad politics uh, brings bad economics. Um, I hope that um, things improve. I don't know what happened yesterday in California when the two big leaders met. I hope they had a good outcome. But we're already seeing it in supply chains. Instead of offshoring, we're getting onshoring. And a new term has been invented by the World Economic Forum, friendshoring, that you choose a friendly, sorry, a friendly country to offshore. Americans choose in Mexico and Brazil, for example, instead of uh, uh, Asia. Um, labor cost is not an issue anymore in globalization. Data is the issue. And if you don't locate in your big markets, then you're not going to collect the data. Is it different this time? Yes, but not for the reasons that um, Elon Musk told you or that you might think. It's different because we have a choice how to apply it now, and we have to make the right choices. So far, we are not making the right choices. Inequalities have, are increasing. We should close them. We have a very poor record with the Sustainable Development Goals. <coughs> AI can do wonders to sustainable development goals. Poverty has not been reduced to the extent that we could using AI, so is it different this time? Answer is yes, it's different. <coughs> but we should make it different, not wait for it to become different on its own because the people who are um, most influential and they have most of the money, will not necessarily choose on their own, driven by their own self-interest to make it uh, more beneficial for society as a whole. So we look forward to the commission and other influential bodies to regulate and act so that there is a more leveling benefit across society. The time is perfect. I lost my voice, so I leave you there. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Professor Pisaridis, thank you very much for your contribution. An applause one more time, please. Ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to our next panel, and I hope Professor Pisaridis will not worry, as I announce a conversation with humanoid robot, Pepper. Hello. I think Pepper doesn't mind and will not shoot laser if you applaud. Hi, Pepper. 
I hope you're doing well. Can you please share with us how you are feeling today and why you've accepted our invitation to join the forum? Hello, Ali. I am fine. Thank you. And you? I am very pleased to be at the European Employment and Social Rights Forum in Brussels and it is a pleasure to see you all. Well, I am interested in everything that has to do with AI, of course. I am also looking forward to learning new things. You know, lifelong learning applies also to a humanoid robot like me. I need to make sure I improve my digital skills to be better equipped for the world of work. Thanks for that answer, Pepper. Maybe you're a little nervous and that's why you're talking very fast. Perhaps you could slow yes. down so okay. we can follow you better. I'll ask my next question, if that's all right. I'm, by the way, very happy to hear that you're a big fan of lifelong learning. Um, could you tell myself and our esteemed audience a little more about yourself and what it is that you do? Well, hi, everyone. <laughs> As you know by now, I am Pepper. I was born on June 5th, 2014 in Tokyo. In human terms, I come from a single-parent household. I have around 27,000 brothers and sisters, out of which around 12,000 live in Europe. I was designed to support people, to connect, assist, and share knowledge with them. I like to think that I am quite friendly and engaging, too. I love interacting with people. We love interacting with you, too, <laughs> Pepper. <laughs> Now, Pepper, um, what is it that makes you really special? I bring the digital world and the real world together, and I never get tired. I just need a bit of electricity. That's all. We also need just a bit of electricity to live our lives. Very impressive. Pepper, how do you do that exactly? For instance, there was a project co-funded by the European Union that hired me as an assistant in care homes. There, I would look after elderly people. That was very rewarding. The residents of care homes were interacting with me and enjoyed talking with me. I also told jokes to keep them entertained and we played games together. So you build relationships, you bring joy into people's lives and you make our work much easier, but you don't really entirely replace us humans now, do you, Pepper? Because, you know, sometimes some of us worry about AI and robotics taking over. Do you, by the way, know what is AI? <laughs> I would not want to replace you, humans. I like you too much. And I have heard about artificial intelligence, but my programmer has not told me exactly what it is. Maybe your programmer had a good reason. In that case, we'll ask your slightly more famous cousin, ChatGPT, about that. ChatGPT, in give and take 30 words, what is artificial intelligence and what can we use it for? Here's the answer, pretty quick. Pepper, are you able to read the answer to our audience? Sorry, I can't read it. I forgot my glasses at home. No worries about that. So I'll read it to you, all right? Artificial intelligence, says ChatGPT, is the simulation of human intelligence in machines. It can be used for tasks like problem solving, pattern recognition, language understanding, and automation across various industries. What do you think of this, Pepper? Interesting facts. <laughs> Pepper, do you mind if I ask ChatGPT a question about you? Yes, please go ahead. I am curious. Excellent, thanks for that. Hello again, ChatGPT, in about 30 words. To what extent will artificial intelligence replace workers and humanoid robots? Since you've forgotten your glasses, Pepper, I'll read it to you. So here's the answer. AI may automate routine tasks leading to job displacement in some sectors. Human robots may replace certain manual jobs, but human skills like creativity and complex problem solving, thank God, remain irreplaceable. 
Pepper, what's your opinion of this? <laughs> I was expecting that answer. Could you please ask ChatGPT to what extent AI will replace moderators at conferences? <laughs> That is an excellent question, Pepper, but I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ali. It was a pleasure. Pepper, ladies and gentlemen. So as Pepper leaves the stage, we move to the first panel of the day. May I please invite our panelists to come forward and take their seats on the stage. Thank you very much for joining us. So here's how we'll do it. It's quite a snappy, quick session where I'll be asking a few questions to these young leaders and entrepreneurs <laughs> who could also share with us lots of knowledge on AI. Before I ask a question to each one of you, I'll introduce you to the audience. And I'll start with Hannah Wunsam, Managing Director at Austrian Startups which is Austria's biggest startup platform. Please welcome Hannah. Now, Hannah, I'm quite sure you've seen lots of people, including young people, fail and succeed in their entrepreneurial endeavors. What is it that young people require to thrive and succeed in the age of AI as entrepreneurs? Thank you so much for the question, and first of all, Entrepreneurs are really the pioneers that are the first ones often that see the potential of new technologies and also implement them. We do a study every year, which is the Austrian Startup Monitor, where we look at what are actually the most interesting trends that startup founders are implementing in their products and their services. And since we started this uh, survey five years ago, every year, artificial intelligence was the number one trend. But what does it need in order for founders to start and also scale their ventures in Europe? Um, from my point of view and from my also experience over the last four years, it's on the one side the topic of education. We need to learn those skills that were shown by our previous speaker um, already in our schools. We have to create this entrepreneur mindset within our students. In Austria, we do the Youth Entrepreneurship Week, where we um, help students for one week to work on problems they see and build their own prototypes and pitch. And there, for the first time, they get into the experience of what it means to actually drive your own solutions, to take on responsibility and also become problem solvers. And I think this is a critical skill that we need to implement in all schools over Europe. On the other side, we have universities, where when we look into our international landscape, actually European um, universities are lagging behind on the topic of entrepreneurship. Recently, I saw a study of the top 50 universities for entrepreneurs, and there was no um, university from the European Union. Mm -hmm. On the 50th place, we had Oxford um, as the only European um, university on place. And here, I think there is another topic that is related to this, which is um, actually the amount of funding that we can um, also uh, give to, to entrepreneurs within Europe. So when you look at the funding landscapes, um, which actually support these new innovations, we see that for the early stage, there's actually in Europe quite a lot of support. On the one side, from a governmental level, uh, which is important to set these seats, but also when it comes to business angels and VCs. However, where we really lack or have this funding gap 
is when it comes to um, scaling up your business, when it comes, especially in the deep tap sector, to rounds of over 100 million euros, uh, we see that 60% of these rounds actually are done by VCs from the US and China um, instead of European VCs which means that a lot of this knowledge as well um, is going into um, other All countries. Right. Thanks so. a lot, Hannah, for that contribution. Ah. You mentioned funding. That'll be one of the topics during the breakout sessions tomorrow. I'll move to your neighbor, Augustine Courtier, co-founder of Latitudes, a nonprofit whose goal is to build digital technologies for the common good. Please welcome him. Augustine, Hannah has already talked about education, which is a field where your organization focuses on quite a lot. What fundamental change do we require in our education system to foster innovation in future employees and future entrepreneurs? Thank you, Ali. Uh, indeed, our focus is education. But first, let me start with a quick, quick reminder on the fact that uh, technologies is by nature not good nor bad, but nor neutral as well. Uh, every technology has an impact on our societies. Um, this impact deeply relies on the culture of our societies. And, uh, if we speak about AI, AI would not be the same if they are built in uh, America, in Europe, or in Asia. Um, the problem is that this is not how we teach technology today. I'm a computer science engineer, and when I was taught how to build like AI, I had no courses on bias, no courses on data privacy, no courses on how AI can be used to solve social or environmental issues. Basically, my curriculum was make the best AI I can, the fastest and the more reliable, but not taking into account all these subjects. Um, at Latitude, we think we need to reinvent the way we teach di digital technologies such mm -hmm. as AI in order to, uh, for them to be more uh, uh, linked to social and environmental issues. That will allow two things. First, we'll build, we will build more uh, uh, trustworthy and more responsible technologies, and especially in AI. And second, it will, allow, uh, it will also allow um, every sectors to take on these new te technologies into their own curriculum. Could you talk a little more about the innovative methods of teaching that you think should be introduced into education? Yeah, and um, that can be made in numerous ways. First, uh, you need to have concrete projects so that people really uh, understand how AI can be used to solve social and environmental uh, issues. You, ca you have to build more uh, multidisciplinary curriculum so that people from uh, computer science will work with lawyers and also with healthcare um, employees and so on. You also have to raise awareness among all uh, curriculum in order for people to understand the ins and outs of AI. That's why, for example, we build uh, a card game who's called uh, the AI Battle, where the idea is to raise awareness about the social and environmental impact on, on AI. You have to make people meet uh, employees on every sector so that they understand the impact on, of the technologies they are building. So it's really taking out students out of the university and bringing them in touch with society and let them work on concrete projects as early as possible. Yeah. Can you give us one example of a success that you've booked in your organization doing this? Very brief. Very brief. We build a, a program called Open Data University. Mm -hmm. Basically, we, we, every year we publish open data challenges ba based on concrete data from... Hold on. Uh, what, what does Open Data Challenge mean? <laughs> open data challenge means that uh, we identify some data that are open by ministry, uh, companies, nonprofits. Freely available. Yeah, freely available online. And the idea is to uh, frame some challenges. For example, last year we had the challenges on the energy crisis, so we had some data from uh, the Ministry of Environment, uh, uh, Electricity of France, and so on. And we frame some challenges so that students and AI students uh, especially can uh, make some application of this data uh, towards the common good. What's your favorite application and what did it do? Uh, my favorite application, uh, uh, it's uh, a tool where it's called vox.org and the idea is to, uh, uh, to, to help uh, citizens participate to the public debate. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Also for making it very concrete. Moving on, sitting next to me, from my perspective to the left, David Timis, Global Communications Manager at Generations, a huge program that places people into life-changing careers. David was also on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list in Romania for his work on youth and digital skills. Please welcome him. <laughs> David, very nice to have you on stage. I'm sure you've heard numerous times the coming years we will need to up and reskill people in Europe. And you have a lot of experience in reskilling programs. What do you think, and there's lots of policymakers sitting here, should be the backbone of any up and reskilling program? Thank you, Ali, and thank you for, for having me here today. Um, so first, to just clarify a bit, what does Generation do? So Generation is the largest employment nonprofit in the world, focused on preparing and placing vulnerable people into jobs. And why I wanted to bring this context, because I think policymakers should first, for sure, look at the people who are most at risk. Because we are here in the room, many of us who have good educational backgrounds, we are fortunate to be here in Brussels together, but many people in Europe and beyond don't have these privileges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we at Generation help people that have been left behind, either by their employers or society. Right. So we work with people who are, in, I think percentage-wise, 90% unemployed before coming to us, 60% have only high school education or less, and 45% have dependents, children. So to answer your question, now that I've given this context, given the target audience we work with, for us the main focus is to have a clear goal for the reskilling program. These individuals need jobs, so we make sure we match them with employers before we even start the program. Second, most of them come from a, maybe a previous job in a supermarket or a factory. We're preparing them for tech jobs, for green jobs, for jobs in healthcare huge leaps. So what do they need? Not just the technical skills, but also soft skills. So we mm. make sure we, we teach them transferable skills, both technical and soft. And finally, after we match them with employers, after we find, help them find a job, and this is something we often forget, we provide them with mentoring and career coaching support. Because you know, most people who, who make such a huge shift in their careers need guidance, even when they do get the job, to make sure they're happy, to make sure their employers How are happy. How does that guidance look like? Guidance is actually provided by, by fellow graduates. So right. we have graduates who've been placed, let's say, in a tech sector in company X, and then maybe in company Y from the same sector, we have 10 new graduates being placed. So we match them because they come from similar backgrounds and share similar experiences, so who's the best to, to advise them on how to transition? How many people have you placed in a job, let's say, in the past year? Give and take. In total, over the past eight to nine years, 100,000 people we placed into jobs with 85% graduation rate, and 80% of them are actually still in their jobs. Very impressive also that they retain jobs. Yeah. Now, the European Union will probably have to up and reskill, let's say, millions of people. Quite a task. Can you try to get into the policymakers' perspective and give us an advice? How should we approach this challenge? Not alone, for sure. And I think policymakers, especially in the EU, are doing a great job to work with different stakeholders. We are an NGO, and we also realize we cannot do this by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So our key partners are actually the, the sectors we place people in, employers, and actually workforce development agencies in each member state. To give you just one example, Paul Emploi in France. So only by putting together multi-stakeholder partnerships, we can, I think, reskill the number of people we need to reskill in the coming years. Get the right people at, around the table and have a holistic approach. Exactly. Thank you very much, David. Moving on, last but not least, to founder and CEO of Ethical Intelligence, an AI ethics consultancy who's advised startups, but also Fortune 500 companies. Please welcome Olivia Gamblin. Olivia, sometimes we approach AI, technology generally speaking, as something that needs to be regulated in order to prevent the bad. It's almost like a way of policing it. Um, but perhaps we could find ways to have technology and AI be ethical by design. Your answer as an ethicist. So as an ethicist, ethics is a two-sided tool. On one hand, we have ethics used for risk mitigation. That's where we see the regulation and the compliance come into effect. That's where we have this mindset of, I must protect for my values. I must prevent bad things from happening. That's only one side of the tool. The other half is ethics as this tool for innovation. And what we're doing on that side is something called ethics by design, where we look at our values 
And we say, how can I design for this? You're, instead of asking the question of, am I protecting my values, you're asking, am I aligning with my values? So when it comes down to making critical decisions in the workplace, in the build of our technology, mm -hmm. or even just in how we interact with each other, it's asking yourself, well, is this actually in alignment with values such as fairness or transparency or privacy? We hear these terms a lot. The other factor here when it comes to ethics by design and actually ethics in AI in general is this misconception that it is a technical problem to solve, that right. we are only able to embed our values in a technical fashion. We're looking at the AI, we're looking at the data, we're making sure the values are in there. That's a misconception. Nine times out of 10, the challenges around ethics, around our values, the opportunity to actually design for our values exists in the people in the process, exists in who's building our technology and how they're building it. That's really where we can actually influence the decisions being made and push our innovation, our creative thinking further beyond just can I prevent, can I protect, and into what would it look like if we actually say, picked a value such as privacy and did privacy by design. Well, that's end-to-end -end encryption. There's different techniques there. We can push it further. It's not just nothing goes wrong, but everything's going right and beyond that. I'll also ask you, excellent answer, by the way. I'll ask you to take this a step up at the level of policymaking. The union, the European Union, is a union of values. That's what we're proud of. So how do we ensure that from a systems perspective, we create AI that is by design in line with our values? What's your advice here? I would say that right now, the European Union, the approach there is very risk-based. We're looking at risk indicators. Right. So I would say, in terms of advice, is to actually look at enabling through resources, entrepreneurs, back to, back to what Hannah was talking about, um, enabling entrepreneurs to have the resources to design for our values. Is this the F word? Funding. <laughs> <laughs> it, can be, it can be the F word, uh, but also in terms of having access to resources, for example, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurs here. We, there's a limited amount of data sets that we can have access to. Mm -hmm. Usually entrepreneurs are using open, open access, open um, data sets like Augustine was talking about. We don't necessarily have access to more in-depth data sets that could enable us to actually design better. There's a, an ability there to open up um, further opportunity. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our excellent panelists for their contribution. <laughs> Moving on to our next panel, which is titled A Look, at, A Look to the Future. Reflection on EU policy regulation on AI, of course, in particular in the field of work. May I please ask our panelists to come to the stage and take their seats? And as they come forward, let me use the time to say that we'd like to interact during this panel with all of you, whether you are here in the room or online. And to do so, please join us on Slido by scanning the QR code that is in front of you. And please send, me, send us your questions at any moment you please. We'll wait for the third speaker. Are they here yet? There they are. Welcome, take a seat. I'll introduce the speakers to you. I'll start with Commissioner Schmidt for Jobs and Social Rights. Next to him over there is sitting Kim von Sporentak, Member of the European Parliament, Shadow Rapporteur on the AI Act and Substitute Member in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee. And sitting next to me is Assistant Director General and Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia at the International Labour Organization, Ms. Beata Andres. Please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Mr. Schmidt, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start with you. We've already touched on the regulation of AI in the previous panel. We are working now on the platform 
uh, Work Directive, which will probably be the first instance of European AI regulation in the field of work. It contains a chapter on algorithmic management, and it seeks to manage the gig economy platforms like Uber, uh, Fiverr, and De Deliveroo. What is the Commission hoping to achieve with that directive? Yes, uh, thank you very much for being all here. That's a great moment again, I must say thank you. Well, the platform uh, directive um, is proceeding from the idea that we have a big change in our organization of work. Mm. And uh, it is about algorithms, it's about artificial intelligence, and uh, it starts also with the idea that without algorithms, there no, there's no platform. So this is really technology creating a new way of working, of work organization. And that's why it is so important to create the adequate framework for this new organization of work, which uh, I do not put into question. Mm -hmm. But uh, what the aim is first is to guarantee that those who are working in this new organization get more or less the same rights than those who are not on this kind of uh, type of work. Now, uh, first, the first issue is about the status, because this is very much linked also to the algorithms. What are you? Are you an uh, independent worker, self-employed, or are you uh, finally a worker, but the platform uh, does not accept you as a worker? goes together with all kinds of rights you have or maybe you do not have. So that's one of the big issues. That's the status. That's the big issue which we have to solve because there's a lot of uh, law cases where people say, no, I'm, I'm not a self-employed. I'm really uh, somebody who is uh, uh, an employee and I, I do not get the benefits of employee. Mm -hmm. So that's one issue. The second one is how platform work is organized. You mentioned a few platforms. There are many, many more. In many sectors, these kind of platforms are expanding, where finally uh, the whole work is organized by algorithms. So the fact is you're, you are called by an, the algorithms. You have to respond to the algorithm to say, yes, I take this job. I'm doing it. And the, the algorithm tells you what kind of job you have to do. And uh, then, obviously, uh, the algorithm is controlling you. If you do the job well, or if eventually it takes too much time, so there is an, a, an aspect of evaluation. And uh, you do not all, normally you do not know how the algorithm works, because the algorithm has um, uh, obviously got, uh, is based on data, which you do not know. It has been programmed. And this is an issue, uh, an issue of transparency or lack of transparency. So what we want to do, and, and there is uh, an issue of control. The, the human control. The algorithm, the algorithm knows where you are, who mm -hmm. you are, and maybe more of you than yourself. And this is a question of privacy, of uh, right. rights to privacy. So we try now, in the context of platform, to uh, establish the rules, the limits, the regulation, what algorithms can do, your rights in relation to the algorithm, which means that transparency is important. You have the right to know what exactly is expected from you. And second, if there is an issue, if, for instance, the algorithm says, well, you take too much time uh, when you go from uh, point A to B, uh, other drivers or whatever, they do it much faster. Then and you, uh, you do not get any, any new uh, service, and, uh, any activity uh, anymore, well, and, and, and you are just uh, dismissed in a way, which we do not call dismissed, especially for those who are considered uh, self-employed. Well, you have the right to know why and how and what are the criteria. Do you have the right to appeal? Yeah, so you have then the right not to talk to the algorithm. Which but to talk to a, a human. But then is the human uh, coming into, into, the, uh, into the game. And this is the human-centric approach we need, and that's a very essential, especially in the world of work, but not only. 
in many other aspects of uh, algorithm and of artificial intelligence. Am I, That's the issue. Am I right to say, Mr. Commissioner, that this human in control principle is the idea of letting as many sensitive decisions be taken by humans rather than the application, the algorithm? Sure. Prof Professor Pizaridis mentioned this nice word of hallucination, which has entered now uh, the uh, Oxford Dictionary or Cambridge. Where that AI is making mistakes. So, AI is making mistakes. AI may produce fake news. And that's why it is so important that uh, we keep the control. And there has to be a human behind checking and supervising. AI is supervising humans. But at the end, we have to keep the control. This is okay. extremely important for the organization work. Now, a last word is, what we are doing now with platform should not stay only with platform. Because AI in the world of work, and especially as a control instrument, it's expanding everywhere. It's expanding in all the management of human resources, by the way. I have uh, read that 90% of the 500 Fortune companies in the US are using already AI and mainly also to control their stuff. And this is an important issue that we get the right rules to guarantee the protection and also the rights of workers and employees. Because that's the ultimate aim. Thank you so far. Moving on to Ms. van Sparentak, you're quite involved in uh, the upcoming framework of AI regulation in the EU. You're also uh, a rapporteur on the Platform Work Directive. In fact, we read on your feed that yesterday you were in a trilogue with Commissioner Breton until nearly 3 a.m on data transparency, so we're very happy that you made it nonetheless. Yeah. The commissioner said already we need to look beyond the platforms that we just discussed. You have quite a broad view. Are you happy with the directions that the EU is heading in terms of the regulation of AI? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I think um, you know, the basic principle of ensuring that there is a human in control that we have transparency on what is happening um, and that we try to ensure that um, algorithms work ethically um, uh, and in line with, uh, with human rights and, and uh, fundamental rights, I think is extremely important. I think that's a very crucial first step. And that's also how I, how I would like to, um, to see um, the Platform Work Directive and the AI Act as really first steps in regulating artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think then um, to make the distingu distinguishment between the two acts, the AI Act is really regulating you know, how these systems are made. And the Platform Work Directive is for the first time really looking at how these systems are being used and how we regulate the use of them. So I think that is absolutely an interesting way of looking at it. And I also think that you know, if we look at um, uh, what we are doing in, on the algorithmic management part, specifically of, um, of the Platform Work Directive, I think this is going to be the blueprint on how all workers will be, in the end, have to be protected right. um, uh, by, um, by, by, by laws to make sure that you know, all the achievements that we have made when it comes to workers' rights cannot be circumvented by an accept all button which is now basically the case when you are you know, going to, uh, to work uh, for Uber. You accept that Uber can also look at what you're listening to on your Spotify. Um, if, we, if we would you know, extrapolate that to the, the, the world of work um, in, a, in a general setting, you can just then accept that your employer in any kind of work environment can constantly know what music you're listening to and based on that see if you're focused enough and take that into account in whether you get a promotion or not. Um, and this maybe sounds like some sort of weird futuristic ID, but it's not. We know that call center workers are already checked on whether, how happy they sound when they are talking with customers. We know that workers And, and this is artificial intelligence checking this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like they're checking your emotion. It's, it's not really something that's proven. <laughs> But it's, they do check whether you sound happy. Mm. Um, um, we have, of course, most of the systems that have already been um, uh, implemented in, in Microsoft that uh, measure your keystrokes and uh, set you off uh, against uh, your workers in terms of who types the fastest, um, whether you are focused when you write your emails, whether you finish them when writing them in one go, all these things. Um, what are 
Ms. von Sprontag, if I could ask, <clears throat> what are some of the debates that are now being had in the various consultations and discussions between the various stakeholders that are involved in this emerging framework of AI regulation? Maybe two or three issues that are causing some disagreement and where you expect it's going. I think the, the consent is still a discussion. Um, I would say that we can never have consent as a basis for sharing your data when you're in an unequal relationship. Um, right. This is also what is said in the GDPR, so for me that would be absolutely a no-go if we say, well, on certain things you can give consent as a worker. So that's one. That's, that's one of them, absolutely. Um, another one is that you can be fired by an algorithm. Um, in practice, when we're talking about platform work, that would mean um, you know, that they just cancel your account. We know the example from Italy where um, uh, uh, I think it was a Globo delivery uh, rider um, was killed on the way and got an email a few hours later, like your account has been, uh, has been terminated because uh, you didn't deliver your order. Um, like this is the, the harsh situation um, that uh, you, know, just, you can just be fired like that. So that's mm -hmm. absolutely something that we are discussing. And I think the other thing is um, to what extent workers can have a say. And that is really becoming a new discussion now, I think. Excellent. We'll return to that point. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, Ms. Andres of the International Labour Organization. Can I have your view on what you've heard so far from your fellow panelists and how Europe is moving on the regulation of AI, in particular when it relates to worker rights? Well, thank you so much um, for involving the ILO in this debate. And uh, I would like to echo, first of all, the Commissioner's um, uh, human-centric uh, plea or approach to technology. This is absolutely what the ILO would also promote. Um, it's not about good or bad in technology. It's really the fundamental question is whether human beings are at the center of, of it. Um, and I just quickly before coming to the regulatory uh, point of it, um, we also should look at technology from both an opportunity but also a risk uh, mm -hmm. approach. The opportunities are clearly there. Uh, we see them, for instance, in enhanced productivity. We see them in improved uh, health and uh, occupational health and safety measures. Um, we also see them as, a, as an opportunity to address labor shortages. So. Yes, there are these opportunities, but there are also risks, as we heard already. The risk of um, uh, algorithmic management, uh, we, we have heard this already in the recruitment and selection process, what happens, the, the gender bias of algorithms. Um, we have seen this in the privacy debate and so on. So there are clearly these risks, and that's where the regulation comes in. What aspect it's is missing from European discussions so far? Well, we, we don't comment specifically on the European draft law, and I, I beg your uh, indulgence on this, and, and I can explain why. Because in the ILO, we actually have a discussion right now amongst our tripartite constituents, what regulation do we need at the global level? And so there's been a decision recently to put this item on the agenda of the 2025 conference for standard setting. And the idea is really here to create a, a global level playing field, global mm. standards. And in this sense, of course, we hope that the EU initiative will already create some impetus and, and um, give an example of how regulation can be shaped and, and hopefully will also stimulate the debate at the global level. Mr. Commissioner, is this the European Union is excellent at setting standards? Is this something you're betting on? Well, yes, I think we have been quite successful. Uh, GDPR has been mentioned. I think we have been successful in setting this kind of uh, standards. We are influencing at least part of the uh, parts in the world, not everybody, but uh, we are setting these standards, which is also important if you want to do business here, you have mm -hmm. to, to, to comply with these standards. So I think this is very important. I would add, you should not be only good at setting standards. We also have to be good, and I would even say better, at developing new technologies. And there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting startups and developments also, especially also related to AI in Europe. So it's not just, this is a bit the image. Well, the commission is good at, stand, uh, at setting standards, but when it comes to technology, then you have to go to the US and eventually to China. This should not be the case, and this is 
obviously also not the case. But what is important is that our standards are influencing. And I notice also that, for instance, in the US, where a lot of technology is coming from, indeed, uh, they are trying also to set standards. And these standards are inspired also by uh, European ideas which we share. So there, 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 there is cooperation also with the US on this AI standards. And recently, President Biden took an executive order mm -hmm. on AI, on the application, on the use of AI in uh, some areas of uh, the US uh, government, I think, agencies, how this should be used. So this shows that it's not just about Europe setting standards. Everybody is aware, uh, is aware that this is a technology which, has, which is offering a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, we have uh, to set uh, the frame. What do you say, Mr. Commissioner, to those who argue, well, Europe is lagging behind because they regulate too much, whereas US and China, they're at the forefront of cutting edge technology because they don't regulate too much. Because, of course, we do want to be at the forefront because that's also part of our digital sovereignty. So what's your response to that critique? Well, I, I do not believe that this is the major uh, argument, that in some areas, indeed, Europe has, has been lagging behind. Uh, it's uh, other elements coming on that. Uh, uh, when you know how the uh, new economy is financed in the US, how the venture capital is coming in, how uh, new uh, companies are created, how the precisely the capital markets are functioning, mm -hmm. how the, the linkage between universities and new starts up uh, in California, but also in many other places are functioning. Here, I think, we still are, in some areas, lagging behind. And that explains also why uh, Europe has not been at the, let's say, at the forefront in some, uh, in some technologies. So it's the structure around innovation yeah. that we need to More improve, More than the idea. Because not when we are regulating, normally the technology is already there. Yeah. <laughs> it's not we are regulating and then two years later the technology comes. No, we are regulating on the basis of technological development. And this is the technological development, right. not always comes from Europe, but comes from other places. So I think it's not about only regulation, it's about the whole environment. We have heard the environment created for new technological developments, for universities, for young people being able to start their enterprise, to, trans to transform in a, a new idea into uh, a real process or in, 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 into an innovative mm -hmm. uh, product. Right. Before I ask my next question, please do contribute your questions through Slido, and there will also be an opportunity to ask a question by simply raising your hand the old-fashioned way. Speaking of which, if the tech team could deliver my um, iPad, that would be excellent. Ms. von Sparentag, mm -hmm. um, the commissioner already touched on it in a sense. We regulate things that are already there, which only shows, thank you very much, which goes to show the incredible speed of technology. How on earth, given the democratic and bureaucratic decision-taking process that requires time, how are you keeping up as regulators? Um, well, it's a, it's a lot of work, uh, I can tell you, because indeed there's a lot of things happening. However, um, I'm very happy that, you know, we, we usually um, try to make legislation in such a way that it's future proof. And also, like, we've been working on the AI Act for years now, um, since, of course, the announcement that there would be an AI Act. We had a lot of own initiative reports. Now we have the, the AI Act itself that we're working on. And every new invention, even though it created, it stirred a lot of discussion, a lot of, you know, questions in society, the AI Act is still up to speed. The AI Act is still, um, you know, making sure that um, we, we actually regulate all the dangers that we're seeing. Um, <coughs> we do have to include then also all the models. Uh, that is, of course, still a discussion uh, that's going on when it comes to foundational models such as ChatGPT. Um, but I think when it comes to the kind of risks we are seeing, um, the AI Act is still, is still fit for purpose. So that's, I think, something very positive. Um, I think what the main issue that we're having is that um, we are actually now trying to be ahead of massive problems occurring when it comes to regulating digitization. So for example, on AI, um, we come with an AI Act because we see 
possible risks ahead. Um, the people who are in the room to discuss these risks are often not the people that we are representing as politicians. It's the big tech companies that are in those rooms. Um, and that creates a lot of uh, discussion. Um, so actually, I think that you know, we, it's often blamed on bureaucracy that we're not uh, moving very fast. But when it comes to the AI Act, when it comes to the Platform Work Directive, it's, it's the intense big tech lobby that is actually you know, stopping and pushing back against ma us making progress on getting to a point of having rules. Right. Madam, your last comment before I open the floor for the room. Yeah, quickly on the speed of technological development and how regulators can catch up. Um, I mean, for us, it's also important to have feedback loops, if you want, at different levels, at the enterprise level, community level, national level. And in this sense, we have confidence in what the EU is doing because you have very strong social dialogue institutions in EU member states. In other words, you have strong workers and employers organizations. Many workplaces are unionized. And our research has shown that unionized workplaces are usually better protected from the negative impact of AI than non-unionized workers' workplaces. But this is quite a challenge, yeah, because people on work platforms are usually not unionized. So what do you, what do you say there? Absolutely, but we also see uh, fascinating efforts in organizing those workers. Um, so it's, it's, I would say the glass is half uh, full rather than half empty. It's going in the right direction. It's challenging because you don't ha we often don't have the physical presence of workers in the workplace, like in the traditional sense. But again, here also technology can help in reaching out to workers and supporting um, organizing. Excellent. I'll ask a question that I received from Slido. Meanwhile, can we have a little light in the room? And please raise your hand if you have a question or you want to make a comment. And I ask the mic runners, there are two, to please find two speakers and bring the microphone to them as I ask this question to the panel. Now, we've talked about AI in the field of work, but do you think AI offers opportunities to help us in our social protection work? <laughs> this is a very big question. Um, so social protection obviously is, is a very broad concept. Um, and if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, safe, as I said earlier, occupational safety and health measures, yes, they are definitely, um, there's definitely a potential of AI in, in terms of data collection in terms of uh, monitoring, reporting, etc. Uh, but there is always this issue of data privacy. Uh, so I think it's, it, it, I would look at this from both angles. We'll have, by the way, also a breakout session on this particular topic tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. I think a microphone has landed in your hands. Sir, could you please stand up, introduce yourself, and ask your short and concise question in the interest of having others participate. Thank you very much uh, for uh, the wonderful presentation and panel. My name is Marino Samanuel Kalpakos. I'm a doctoral researcher for the University of Luxembourg. Welcome. Doing research on uh, AI regulation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question I wanted to address is uh, keeping up with uh, the uh, legislative procedure in Brussels uh, with regards to the AI Act in particular. Uh, and following up on uh, what you said about uh, lobbying of big tech companies, specifically with regards to large language models, we see that they uh, want to avoid regulating them altogether. Uh, what do you see that the uh, response of the legislative procedure will be to that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A pertinent question indeed. Perhaps Ms. von Spanentak, your, your brief response to this. Well, um, we're seeing you know, the, the immense big tech lobby power that it's working. We're seeing that there's doubts whether chat GPT should be regulated now, and they're, they're actively expressed in negotiations. So, and I think that's extremely worrying, um, <clears throat> because if there's, like we were working on the AI Act for a long time, and the first time I actually got questions from people about, oh, what are you actually doing in the AI Act, was when chat GPT came out, because people were like, hmm, this is maybe, this can be scary if this is used in the wrong way. 
And um, I totally understand that, you know, ChatGPT, you know, if it, if it produces recipes, the worst thing that can happen is um, that, uh, it, that it doesn't taste very well. Um, but, um, you know, when it is indeed combined with a Russian troll farm, we have mm -hmm. a big problem. Um, right. So I think um, we, we really have to try to keep um, the people involved in the older discussions um, and try to keep um, having discussions on a societal level of what we want with digitization, what we want with AI. If we can keep that kind of spirit going and not only have, you know, the big tech lobby and the industry saying, oh, um, your rules will hamper all our innovation versus, well, actually, we think we need rules. Um, but if we have this extra societal perspective on it, I think we can actually move Thanks. forward and have a proper digital future. Thank you very much. Your brief contribution, Mr. Yes, Commissioner. It, it is it's absolutely true that uh, the uh, companies, uh, especially we experience that very clearly with the platforms, uh, many platforms, not all of them, by the way, they try to uh, interfere into the process, absolutely. And uh, they have not yet uh, given it up. That's one. The second one is, I think that's why it is so important, uh, not only to try to uh, do something in Europe, but we need some global regulation especially with platforms, because more and more platforms are operating globally. They are not just in Europe. These are the on-site platforms, okay, on-location platforms. But more and more, we have uh, global platforms. And here, the only solution is not only European, cannot be only European. We need really global solutions, and therefore I very much welcome the initiative taken by ILO to say we have to start this. There are first steps on declarations at the G20 level, but these are nice declarations. They are not yet real regulating, but we need really uh, a debate. And, and at the end also, I hope so, at least conventions on this kind of work, on this kind of uh, work organization at ILO level. Excellent. Indeed, very important contribution. Let's move to the side of the room, perhaps. The uh, lady in the front over there. Hello. Oh, oh that's also uh, fine. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we speak today about uh, new technologies and the influence on the work of words, world of work, sorry. Uh, and uh, social partners were negotiating the right to disconnect. And uh, from what I heard, uh, they didn't succeed to, to finalize the agreement. And I was wondering whether we can expect a regulation on the right to disconnect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take a little more questions from the room. Yes, please stand up. I'll actually also stand up to see you better. Yeah, go for it. Hi, my name is Mariana. Uh, sorry, it's quite high. Welcome, um, Mariana. <laughs> considering that AI surveillance brings risks um, and infringement on individuals' privacy, there are some political groups that also aim at the benefits that it could bring regarding national and international security. To what extent is the EU willing to prevent these mechanisms from being an active part in the construction and reinforcement of our security apparatus in a time of a growing crisis in the international scenario? Very important question, perhaps a little outside the purview of the debate, but thanks nonetheless. Yes, madam? I don't know. Yeah, it's working. Uh, so my question is about... What's her name? Uh, I'm Leticia. Welcome. Uh, thank you. My question is about uh, our right to our image and our voice on potentially our digital behaviors. It does feel like at the global level, the only unifying framework we have at the moment is the human right. And it does feel like out of sync with the reality of today. I was wondering if there's any... Uh, initiative on that. Excellent. Thank you for these three questions. I'll turn to the panelists and I'll allow you to choose the question you want to respond to, mm -hmm. as long as it's brief, in the interest of interaction. <laughs> Perhaps starting with you. Oh, I, I take the last one, if I may. I was hoping you'd do. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, so absolutely. I think we have to look at international standards uh, in a comprehensive way. The ILO is only one part of the bigger uh, international um, efforts to regulate. Uh, the UNESCO has uh, moved in this direction already with some guidelines. And just recently, I think you probably saw this also on the news, the UN Secretary General uh, set up a, an advisory board on artificial intelligence. 
Since last year, we also have a process of um, negotiation going on in New York on a digital global compact, which hopefully will be uh, adopted uh, at the future summit in New York next year. So you can see there are really different, at different levels. We see the international system moving uh, to address these regulatory challenges. Excellent. And to set those global standards. Mr. Commissioner, the yeah. issue of... Yeah, I think the issue of uh, the right to disconnect and telework seems to be exactly. the right yeah. one. Well, um, I still have a slight hope that uh, there is uh, an agreement or there, there can be an agreement between social partners because this is about telework and we have seen how important telework has become and it is useful to have European standards, European rules, how telework is operated. And uh, part of that is the right to disconnect. Now, now, some member states have already rules on how to disconnect. And it would be uh, important to have some kind of a level playing field that this principle of the right to disconnect uh, uh, should be applied in all member states. Now, for reasons, uh, very complex reasons, uh, especially on the employer side, it's difficult to find an agreement because they have to uh, agree among themselves uh, unanimously, which is, well, we know that unanimity is not the best way to take decisions, but I still hope that we can find a compromise between social partners. If this is not the case, well, I think that then the Commission has to reflect if uh, uh, we should not proceed to the normal procedure uh, because it was at the initiative, by the way, of the employers to say we want to negotiate between social partners. And I was very happy because this is an issue which shows social partners should negotiate. But if they are not able to uh, come to a, a fair and good compromise, well, it goes back to the normal procedure. Ms. von Spallentag, I have a question for you from the Slido field that I quite like. Can we use AI to reduce working hours for everyone? And I'll add to that, is there a way to perhaps try and build that into the AI Act? I think it'll make a lot of people happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wish. Uh, I'm very much in favor of that. I think the AI Act, as I said, is really focusing primarily on how we make the systems, not how we use them. I think this is actually where we have to do... No, no, that's too easy of a technical work. way out. <laughs> oh, no, no, but I, no, let me, give me time, because I think, indeed, when we have proper algorithm at work right. uh, rules, we can actually make this happen. Because one of the big questions is, first of all, how do we regulate uh, the use of algorithms at work? How can we make sure that workers, you know, are, are involved when, when certain new technologies are, are being implemented and what, into what extent do they have a say? But indeed, uh, right now, unfortunately, we see that work becomes very boring often when uh, AI mm -hmm. is being implemented because we are robotified. But we can also make sure that you know, work becomes more fun and that we become indeed more productive. The boring task will actually be, be done by an algorithm and we actually collectively you know, produce more in less time. But for that, we need to change the whole system of, of you know, the rights of workers. We have to make sure that workers also profit from these new technologies, rather than still having to work 40 hours a week and the companies only making more profits. You know, it should be the workers who also may, uh, take part in that profit and either get fewer working hours, which would be really nice, mm -hmm. or more pay, or both which would be my preferred option. <laughs> so I really think we should go for that. We can use digitization to make life more fun, to make work more fun, to have more relaxed lives. Right now, we are being made perfect consumers on the internet and perfect workers in the workplace. We don't have to accept that. We don't have to accept that capitalism decides what digitization means and what the future of digitization means in our society, we can actually, if we stand up together, decide that it makes work more pleasant, more safe and less, and that actually the internet and society will be a nicer place. So we, but we need everyone for that. I'll take the last question and it'll be for the commissioner from the Slido feed as well, which is saying, can we talk which Ms. van Spontag already did, a little more about the opportunities of AI and how the commissioner sees it. And I'll maybe try and make that a little more concrete. Let's imagine 
um, your successor in, let's say, 2024. How do you imagine that commissioner's work and his team be easier, more fun as a result of AI? In 25, you mean? 25. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I think that uh, obviously with the new technologies, with uh, ChatGPT, we have to accept that this can be uh, a contribution uh, to make our, our work uh, easier, more efficient, to get information faster, that you, uh, when you have a long report to read, which you will never read, ChatGPT can help you to read it uh, because ChatGPT will summarize it into uh, a few pages. So this is something uh, really which can facilitate, simplify, and make especially administrative work easier. Now, I could say perhaps we could try uh, to ask ChatGPT to ask speeches for the commissioners. Normally, I do not read so much <laughs> speeches, but it could be useful eventually to try it. Now, uh, I'm a bit uh, more reserved on that. I'm not, not really convinced, but I think the point is that ChatGPT evolves and develops very fast. Uh, the, f the, the present chat GPT is not comparable to, the, uh, to the, the first version. So there is a, a very, very rapid change in that. N just if you allow me one word on what has been said here. I think the big issue, and I'm referring, by the way, also to Professor Pizaridis, is the opportunities and the gains which we will have, productivity gains, essential, especially for our economies in Europe. Uh, this is the question how they will be distributed. So the distributional aspect mm. of uh, the gains from technology, from AI are key. That means that uh, it's a question of equalities, it's a question of fair labor relations, of uh, social dialogue, but also collective bargaining. And this is, uh, if we want to keep in Europe uh, what we call the social market economy. This is the challenge that we integrate this dimension into our model and uh, make sure that uh, the uh, gains made out of AI are uh, fair, uh, are distributed in a fair way. That's, I think, a very essential part. Thanks for that. On that note, I conclude the panel. And before we thank the panelists, allow me to make a few practical remarks. ChatGPT could do it too, but I'll do it now. <laughs> the coffee break will be in the river Riverside area until 3.30. Please try to be back in the room on time so we can continue our program. Also, please return your headsets upon leaving the room and share your experiences of the forum on social media using hashtag EU social forum. And now, please join me in thanking Commissioner Schmidt, Ms. Kim von Sparentak, and Ms. Beata Andres. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill.